Welcome to Texas Football. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Jerry Hamilton and C.J. Vogel. It's time for State of the Program, brought to you by Adam Lowy of the Lowy Law Firm. Hey, guys, uh, each and every week we try to take a big-picture look uh, at the Longhorns. Uh, this week, I think we want to line it out a certain way. Each of us have heard different things about the Longhorns this spring training, right, or this spring practice. And I want to go position by position and really talk about every single one of them and what we've heard that may be a little different or maybe in line with what we thought uh, at the beginning of the year. And then I want to close it out uh, by talking uh, more uh, about the transfer portal. It's a big topic right now because it opens up next Tuesday, uh, April 16th, before closing on April 30th. Uh, Texas is going to have to add and drop, most likely, some guys, uh, however you want to term that, or they're going to have to enter the portal. They're going to face some attrition. Uh, but we want to talk about that. Let's start, though, uh, Jerry and CJ, with the quarterback position uh, in spring ball. What have you heard in spring ball that you think is noteworthy from a big picture perspective? Jerry, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just Quinn's continued maturity, uh, comfortable in his skin. Uh, life has slowed down for him, which when life slows down, the game slows down, right? It, it all kind of goes hand in hand. And so I think just a natural progression as a year three starter coming up for Quinn and a guy who hasn't had two full years starting due to injury. Uh, so I, I think it's just he's part of the natural progression for him. Um, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of talk about Sark and Quinn in the red zone. That's going to have to have to play out in games. Uh, I don't I'm not really bought. I don't really care about what people are saying now. That stuff's going to have to play out on Saturdays. Um, when there's time on the clock, right? Um, so, uh, but I think Quinn's just that natural maturity of being a third-year starting quarterback, the confidence. He keep, continues to get more confident, as he should after his pro day, by the way. Uh, with Arch Manning here, nothing but good things there. Continue to hear his athleticism. Even Saturday in the scrimmage from people that are there, um, his athleticism kind of surprises people that really haven't studied him. Um, so I, I think his uh, arch is continuing to pro, uh, progress there in his maturity um, as a quarterback, right, um, in the Texas system. Not maturity off the field, not maturity as a quarterback per se, but in the Texas system. Uh, that's part of the uh, the progression for any young quarterback. And then uh, Trey Owens, better feet in the pocket than maybe even I gave him credit for a senior in high school. He had, he had improved in that area, uh, but I think his feet have continued to get quicker in the pocket. Um, and obviously he can make all the throws or Sark wouldn't have recruited him. CJ, I, I want to ask you if you have anything as it relates to the quarterbacks, uh, but I also want you to segue and talk a little bit about the running backs because each of us heard really good things in that regard. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the big thing that I've took, taken away so far this spring, especially after talking to a couple guys after uh, the scrimmage on Saturdays, it, it's much cleaner with the quarterbacks. You don't see as many – errant throws. You don't see as many balls hitting the ground. You don't see as many interceptions in practice. And I, I know Sarkeesian mentioned Malik Muhammad had an interception on Monday, uh, Monday's practice, but that's, that's going to happen just not to the level in which we saw, or at least heard about a year ago, which to me is very uh, important when you talk about what hurt the Texas Longhorns a year ago. One, it was red zone, but two, I mean, it was turnovers. You look at Oklahoma, you had three stops, one of which was on the goal line that, that, I, in my eyes, I count that uh, that turnover on downs on the one yard line as a turnover. Uh, Washington, you had two fumbles. I know Quinn did a good job a year ago holding on to the football, uh, not throwing the ball into uh, dangerous areas as well. But again, just taking those little steps to becoming a more complete passer right now for both Quinn and Arch and even Trey Owens. You're not hearing about, you know, loose with the football, throwing in dangerous areas, creating turnovers there. To me, very important, very impressive so far this spring with All this right, running what, back. What about what about the running backs too? Because I, I you talk about Saturday, uh, we they yeah. we heard nothing but glowing reports, not only of Jaden Blue but also Trey Wisner. I you know I've heard stuff about Cedric Baxter. What do you what are you hearing? Yeah, those two feel like. We've hear, heard about them after every practice so far, whether it be Sarkeesian, whether it be from uh, family members, recruits on, at, at the scene, or even other players and player availabilities. I mean, Jaden Blue has been the, probably the guy we've heard the most about at that running back position, and it, for good reason. You know, he's added to his frame. He's right under 200 pounds right now. We know the speed and the quickness is going to be there. I made a number of big plays in the scrimmage on Saturday. To me, it sounds like he's carving away himself a pretty uh, healthy 
you know, kind of volume role in this Texas backfield. Who's going to be joining him? We obviously know C.J. Baxter will, who's added to his frame, you know, added some of that armor that Rod likes to talk about as well. Uh, he's had his moments, of course. Uh, but Trey Wisner, to me, Bobby, we talk about a guy that could certainly feel the shoes of Keelan Robinson and then some. That's probably a guy that we need to keep a closer eye on moving forward because everything that we've heard about from Trey Wisner is he gives 110% effort. He's going to be there. He's going to give it your all, and he can make some plays with the ball in his hands. I think he's going to be up for a very large role this uh, this upcoming fall. And, and Jerry, I'll, add you, bud. Yeah, I'll add to that. I was told again last night the running back room as a whole is the healthiest it's been in years and years at Texas. Um, I was told that uh, again last night, like I said, and and the two freshmen are referenced as being very, very good football players at the running back position. So obviously Cedric Baxter uh, and Jaden Blue are going to uh, suck up most of the oxygen in the room as far as when people talk about the running back position in that running back room. Obviously Trey Weisner's had a really good spring, but uh, Christian Clark, Jarrett Gibson behind the scenes are getting a lot of praise around the 40 acres. So it talks to the, speaks to the depth of the running back room at Texas headed into August. Yeah, when you said healthy, I, I meant you meant that not in a, a you know dinged up kind of way, but actually as in how good it is and how yeah. the depth that it has. So from a, a long term perspective, it looks really healthy. All right, hey, I want to I want to mention this. I want to before we go to the wide receivers, I want to say thank you uh, to our sponsor. That's Adam Lowy, the Lowy Law Firm. Each and every uh, state of the program is brought to you by Adam uh, and his law firm, the Lowy Law Firm. If you've been injured in a car wreck truck wreck, motorcycle accident, ATV, give Adam and his group a call or reach out to them at lowylawfirm.com. They've got 20 years experience uh, in injury law. Give him a shout, lowylawfirm.com. All right, let's talk about the wide receivers. Uh, probably no more anticipated position this spring, I think is fair to say, uh, with all the newcomers, uh, Jerry and CJ. I want to I take this one to start. Yeah, Isaiah Bond. Matthew Golden, uh, then you have Jonte Cook, DeAndre Moore. But really, if there's been one guy that we think has been a revelation of sorts, I think it's Ryan Wingo based on what Steve Sarkeesian has been saying. Would y'all agree with that or y'all have other thoughts? No, absolutely. Again, I, uh, last night somebody mentioned that uh, he's pretty special. I mean, so look, I mean, that you got to go do it on the field on Saturdays now. You got to be able to handle everything pre-snap with what uh, Steve Sarkeesian requires of his wide receivers, especially learning multiple spots over time. Uh, but uh, Ryan Wingo, uh, Bobby, you've said it, the most talented receiver Texas has recruited since Roy Williams. I 100% agree with you, and I think uh, people behind the scenes, even if they didn't see Roy Williams, are saying uh, this is a potentially special wide receiver. CJ, you got CJ, you have more? Yeah, on Wingo specifically, it's, it's really encouraging that we're hearing this much about him so often because – you know, behind the scenes, I think a lot of people behind uh, uh, in that Texas uh, facility still expect him to improve. You know, this is a guy that's been on campus for two months, three months, and he still rounds a number of his routes. You know, that t uh, that fine tuning of his you know approach to being a wide receiver in his routes can certainly take a step up. But since we're hearing about him so often right now, it's hard to imagine that will keep him off the field. And I, I, I look back to Saturday, Jerry, when we talked to just about every wide receiver prospect that was on campus, one of the first names that they mentioned uh, that stood out to him was the freshman Ryan Wingo. So very Especially to Corey and Moore, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So very encouraging on that front. I like what I hear about Matthew Golden, who's just getting back to 100% yeah. healthy right now. Uh, and plus, we've only heard uh, the explosive adjective for a guy like Isaiah Bond, who we know is very talented, that room right now, to me, uh, should create some fireworks this fall, and I'm excited for it. And, and I, let's let's add that, that because we don't want him to be forgotten because it is spring practice. That Silas Bolden is at Oregon State. He's going to be a grad transfer, and he will absolutely factor into this wide receiver room, both in the punt return game and at the slot receiver position. And it, uh, Texas will become an even faster and quicker team when he arrives. Yep. Good stuff, guys. Hey, what about tight end? Um, Gunnar Helm, Sark on Tuesday was effusive in his praise of Gunnar Helm and where he's at. He is a complete tight end for Texas at this point. Amari Nyblack is more of that receiver type. And then uh, Sark also talked a lot about Juan Davis and how he's up this game. Uh, Y'all get the, I just get the feeling Sark thinks that that, that room is in good hands right now. Y'all, would y'all echo that sentiment? Yes, because uh, like you said, Gunnar Helm is a guy who can, he's an all around tight end, right? Uh, fourth year 
under this staff coming up, right? And uh, he's a guy with a future in football in the NFL on some level. Uh, but then Amari Nyblak, look, I mean, I, I think if you're Sark and, the, and those guys, you kind of want to keep him quiet a little bit, but with the understanding that he brings something different to this position than Texas has had under Sarkeesian, a different level of speed. Uh, he moves like a wide receiver at the tight end position, and there's just not many guys you can legitimately say that about. Uh, so it's all about continuing to learn that playbook. I mean, look, it, it, I think the big thing with Amari Nyblak is understanding what his strengths are and not p- p- putting expectations in areas that, that aren't going to be a strength. He's not going to be a great blocker. That's not what he's going to be. What he's going to be is the best athlete at tight end Texas has had since when. You guys can argue over the since win part, uh, but that's how athletic this guy is coming in, and his ability to make big plays helps unlo- uh, unlock uh, that uh, down-the-field passing game, maybe more so than it has been under Sark. All right, I uh, got the, the tight end group, and then obviously we next is the offensive line. Uh, CJ and Jerry, uh, look, Longhorns bring back four or five starters, uh, but NATO Umio Zulu, is fighting off folks, or trying to fight – uh, Hayden Connor for the starting left guard spot. Cole Hudson is not going quietly into that good night either. He's trying to push it up. Uh, DJ Campbell has been quasi injured, was injured in the scrimmage on Saturday. We're trying to check on his status right now. But by and large, just the depth and the quality of it is really, in my opinion, uh, one of the stories of spring. Based on what we thought, it's as good or better than what we thought going into the spring camp. Uh, CJ, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think you could look at this Texas offensive line group and feel very healthy or very comfortable with the 10 deep, you know, with the way that Sarkeesians talked about them this spring. You like what you have with your first unit. In fact, you probably love what you have with your first unit, but that second group, not too far behind. And I think that's exactly where Kyle Flood and Sarkeesian hope this position would eventually come to whenever they took this job. You know, it's come a long way. And uh, right now, when you look at the depth at left tackle through right tackle, uh, there's a number of guys that you can point in or, or feel comfortable about taking a position this fall. You know, Trevor Gooseby's a pretty good backup left tackle. We've heard great things about, you know, Jaden Chapman, even Brandon uh, Baker coming in as well as a true freshman uh, for right tackle. So there's a lot of moving pieces that, you know, you'd feel comfortable about moving forward in the fall if an injury were to occur. Uh, but that guard spot to me is very interesting because Sarkeesian mentioned it uh, during his his availability on Tuesday. You know, we've got four guys really vying for two spots. And one of them is a guy who started, you know, for the past couple of seasons. So it's hard to uproot him. But because of the depth and because of the talent of that depth, you're able to have those battles and continue to sharpen the iron that was already on the on the field for you. So it's very encouraging. The one guy that we necessarily haven't heard, uh, I, I guess, a whole lot of uh, about in that interior is Jake Majors, who's been here for four years on that starting spot. So uh, really comfortable right now with who Texas is deploying. And I think we're hearing uh, behind the scenes a lot of great things about the movement that they're creating, not only in the pocket, but in the run game as well. And I would say this on the offensive line, Texas can withstand injury. And that's the the best news for Texas fans is when you can withstand injury, uh, an offensive line doesn't tend to derail your season if you have some bad luck with injuries. Uh, and that, that's the biggest thing for me uh, when I look at the Texas offensive line. And then Texas has two tremendous freshmen, Daniel Cruz and Brandon Baker, and you're not having to hear about them compete for starting jobs as freshmen. That's a good thing for the Texas offensive line. Those guys are going to both be tremendous players, but the fact is is that they're not forced in the action on this team. That's a good place to be on the Texas offensive line. All right, let's – Jerry, I want to stick with you and move over to defensive tackle. Uh, We could comb in some portal talk here, I think, because that's where we think Texas is going to go. Uh, But Tia Savea, they, they, they added to the group this spring. They lost Trill Carter on top of losing to Vondre Sweat and Byron Murphy to the NFL draft. Um, look, they're going to go to the portal, uh, yeah. it looks like, and they want a nose guard or two to add with Aaron Bryant uh, and perhaps Sadir Mitchell and uh, Alex January. Uh, they also want some three technique. Uh, they, they, they've already got the three technique, we think, kind of figured out with uh, not only Alfred Collins, but Jare Bledsoe, Vernon Broughton. Where, where are they at right now? And, it, it, you know, I th- I'm i being told they're going to take try to take two defensive tackles right. in the portal. 
with a with a focus on nose guard, right? Do you think they need to do that? Do you think do you think all of this kind of makes sense to you? Where, where are you at on it? Yeah, so I, I I tend to agree with Steve Sarkeesian. I think Texas is in a little better spot at the line than probably giving credit for. Um, I, I do agree with Sark. I listen to Sark, and I agree with that. Uh, but at the same time, there obviously, it, it, if there's a difference maker, and by difference maker, I don't mean first round pick. I mean it could be third round pick level guy, right? Those are difference makers. Uh, if there's a couple of those guys, one that can play over the ball uh, that's available in the portal, then absolutely Texas is going to go that route. Uh, because I mean, look, Texas is. At the, I think they're going to be a better team than we were last year. I think there's some confidence coming out of Austin that that might agree with that. But at the same time, uh, these guys chase perfection. Uh, they're not, they're, they're not chasing, okay, we're good enough to compete. All right, let's just go do it. Not in this day and age of the portal of college football. Uh, these guys are chasing perfection. And, and I think uh, legitimately Texas is a, a interior D lineman or two, which I agree with you, two would be the number from feeling like we're absolutely putting a better team on the field than a year ago. I think that's where things are at. Um, uh, and the biggest thing with these guys and it, it, you could say the same thing about all of them, is consistency. Who, after this spring, this spring guys should take some small steps, right? But in August, who's going to take the big steps and become a consistent player? Is it Jure Bledzo? Is it Sadir Mitchell? Can Alex January do it at a young age? Uh, can Aaron Bryant do it in a role, possibly? What we're going to find out is somebody has to take the steps in August because Texas has to. These this coaching staff is only going to put players on the field they can trust. Yeah, it, it, Texas has too much depth to put players on the floor uh, on the field they can't trust. So who's going to earn that trust? I'm not sure anybody on the team that needed to take the big step has taken that biggest step this spring. We'll see what happens in August. Sounds like maybe Aaron Bryant might be broaching that a little bit, just from the things I'm hearing. All right, CJ, I'm going to go to you at Edge. Uh, Trey Moore has been a little bit of a revelation uh, for the Longhorns. Uh, it, you will, most people will get their first chance to watch him a week from Saturday at the spring game. But uh, CJ, uh, what else about Edge kind of strikes you, or, or what have you been hearing there? Yeah, just the the sheer amount of speed that this group now has. You know, you have a, a healthy Colton Vosick, a five-star Colin Simmons, and, of course, Trey Moore added to this group, of course, with Zeno Umiozulu as well. Uh, but to me, whenever I talk to people around the program about what we're seeing from the edge spot, it's just – quickness. And I think Texas had the size a year ago with Ethan Burke and with Baron Sorrell. But I think at some point they were a bit limited with their BGO getting into the backfield. With Trey Moore specifically, I was told that he's in the backfield by the time the ball is snapped. That to me indicates what we knew of him at UTSA and how he was able to garner so much, so many sacks and pressures on the quarterback. He's not a big physically imposing guy. He's not going to intimidate you. He probably won't be the first guy off the bus. But because of that first step and because of how fast he is, he's able to get to the quarterback. Colin Simmons as well, who uh, had a pair of sacks in the scrimmage. We heard he was a, a, a menace of sorts off the edge position. When you can combine that with a Burke and Sorrell, plus go deep with a guy like Vosick or even a Billy Walton or Jamon Tapp or Justice Finkley, I mean, now you're looking at a wealth of talent in that group. And it, it certainly is, is not going to be – uh, a weak spot for this team. I think right now heading into the SEC, if there's one spot you'd love to have uh, probably a leg up on on opposing offenses, it would probably be the ed edge rushing and the speed coming off the edge to pressure quarterbacks. Right now, I think Texas is going to have a wealth of it come this fall. And uh, I would say this, the versatility. They have more versatility with this group. If, if you want to uh, drop guys in coverage, right, it, it bring pressure from different areas, uh, simulated pressures. I think Texas has more versatility at this position than a year ago, and that's something that can't be underestimated in this defensive scheme this year. All right, Jerry, I want to I want to stay with you on linebackers, but first to say one final thank you to our sponsor, Adam Lowy, LowyLawFirm.com. He's been uh, around for twenty plus years, helping folks in the Austin and Texas, Austin and around Texas uh, with their injuries. Give him a shout if you want consultation on your injury that you sustained in an auto accident. Uh, that's LoweyLawFirm.com. Adam, I appreciate you very much for your sponsorship of On Texas Football. All right, uh, Jerry, staying with you on linebackers, um, uh, we've got a guy like uh, uh, like Anthony Hill, who is the you know big time guy. You know he's the 
possible first round pick. But to have a sixth year guy like David Benda stepping up, uh, has that really been probably the story of spring uh, at linebacker is David Benda? Yeah, I think maybe combined because you hear more about Bend, especially since Sark brought him out in front of the media uh, right right there with Quinn, this kind of start spring practice. But I'd also say Maurice Blackwell being a bigger guy, another year in the program, weighing up to 220 pounds in that area code now. I, I, I think those two guys, we've heard enough about them this spring to possibly say, okay, Texas is, feels a little bit more confident than maybe the fans, maybe we did in the media headed into the spring. Uh, and, and I think Benda and Blackwell are two different players that have two different strengths as players, and that's a good thing. Um, and, and then, you know, look, the other thing is I think some fans would love to be hearing a, a, something about some of the young guys, along Leonga LaFowle, Darren Gillette, uh, some of those younger players. Uh, but, but I think the reality of this is you want those experienced players uh, to take those steps a, a year older in the program especially earlier in the season, especially when you go up to Ann Arbor. I think that's so important. The experienced players are ready to go in what's going to be a physical game in Ann Arbor. Um, and again, I think Texas has versatility with this linebacker group. I think as the season moves along is when some of these younger names uh, that the Texas fans really want to hear from are going to start to surface a little more. Got it. All right, uh, hey guys, let's, let's talk about the secondary, all three of us together, because I, I think that there's so many guys all, yeah. and there's corner safety, et cetera, right? Star position. Uh, takeaways for y'all at this point. Uh, CJ, I'll start with you. Just take take big picture takeaways here. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to start with the star spot because to me that it, it kind of unlocks the versatility and how much depth you'll have throughout the remainder of your secondary. What Sarkeesian said Tuesday about Jalen Gilbo to me, you know, kind of sparked the alarms. He's back. That's what he told, or that's what Sarkeesian told media about Jalen Gilbo to me is very important because one, allowing Jod A. Barron, who is a very cerebral player with great instincts and just kind of finds the football to move around to safety out to corner, you can plug and play him just about anywhere in that secondary and feel comfortable with what you have. But that star spot is very important in PK's defense. Knowing that if you do move him from that spot on the defense, you're going to have a similar level of output. To me, allows for the Texas secondary to truly reach its you know maximum ceiling, regardless of who's on the field. If it's Jade or Jalen, I like what I heard a lot about Jalen Gilbo. Uh, but to me, the, in big picture wise, talking about the secondary, it's, it's a lot quicker. The athleticism is there. They're getting to footballs faster. I talked earlier about the quarterbacks not throwing interceptions, but that doesn't mean catches and receptions aren't being contested. You know, guys are getting to the football. They're getting hands in the honey basket. Uh, it's making life very difficult for a lot of these wide receivers, which I think we expected after last year. That improvement is going to be seen this fall. And right now, coming out of spring, this group is very athletic and they're hungry to go out and prove guys that, uh, you know, hey, we knew we heard everything coming off of the offseason. We know that this was a group that was doubted. They're playing with a chip on their shoulder at the moment. Jerry, what are your big takeaways, buddy? Um, I, you know, safety is the most improved position on the team to me. Uh, everything I'm hearing, uh, look, Jelani McDonald, a year into the program. I mean, the fact that he actually got some one reps Saturday, and I'm not saying he's going to be a starter, but the fact that he's risen to that level, um, it says a lot. Sark mentioned Jelani McDonald uh, in the press conference Tuesday. It, it's such a faster, bigger, more athletic room this year. Um, July McDonald adds some of that. Andrew McCuba adds a lot of that, right? And then your freshman coming in, Xavier Phil Samee and Jordan Johnson Rebel, have both been really good. They, uh, it, it's just they're playing behind some more experienced players. Derek Williams in year two at Texas. I mean, so just think about how much bigger, more athletic uh, as a whole this uh, safety position has gotten at Texas. And um, I, I, I think it's by far – going to be the most improved position on the team. Now, part of that may be that was considered the weakest part of the team last year. Now, of course, when you add a Makuba out of the portal, you have Jelani McDonald, who actually spent a year training at one position for the first time in his life. Then you bring in two really talented freshmen and Derek Williams year two, Michael Taft's coming back. Jade Barron, you have versatility with him. If Jalen Gilbo is back, uh, then the safety position is going to be by far the most improved position on this team. And what that does for me, guys, is if you're better off the edge and you're better at safety, man, that takes a lot of pressure off your corners. Mm -hmm. you got it. 
Yeah, here's my point. Here's the thing. You're better at safety. I I would I would agree with that. More speed at safety. Yes. Uh, certainly with Makuba and uh, Derek Williams, more full time roles along with Michael Tapp and now potentially Jelani McDonald. My bigger takeaway is you know the backup roles and how I think the sef- secondary as as a whole has fewer holes in it. Yeah. Uh, if that makes sense. So. You know, Gavin Holmes is a backup. Well, he, he he's he's a guy last year that was just getting used to the system at Texas, came in as a former starter, at, but now he's the third corner, right? Um, you also have more depth at safety. Jalen Gilbo, quote unquote, to CJ's point, is back. It's it's all about depth. Jelani McDonald now has a spring under his ha- under his belt yeah. at, at safety. And if there was anything that I had worried about Jelani McDonald and had been told to worry about is you know, it's not just a guy, even though he looks pretty, has to still play pretty, right? Yeah. And has to get that. And so for Sark to talk about him uh, on Tuesday was also encouraging. I, I think it's just the depth as a whole. They've got more numbers than they've had, not unlike the D, not unlike the offensive line in that regard, right, guys? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that that's probably where I'm at. Uh, all right. Overall, let's let's skip forward and talk a little portal because that's coming up. It opens on Tuesday. Bear Alexander, big off, big defensive lineman from uh, Southern Cal, has been talked about. We don't know if he's for sure going into the portal. There's conflicting reports. You know, Southern Cal's trying to say he's staying, and um, Hayes Fawcett and others are saying he's going. Who knows? We know that Texas would be interested if he came available. Right. Um, and we also know they're going to be interested in others too. That, that's the whole thing that I want to get across to people. Texas is looking for help over the ball at, at defensive tackle. I don't know that they're going to necessarily go anywhere else. The other thing that we've got to be looking for, it's not just all additive here. Yeah. The, the, the concern every Longhorn fan should have is, you know, they're at 89 scholarships. CJ, you did a scholarship count last week that was tremendous. Well, that means they have to lose a net four. So if they try to go and gain two defensive tackles, that means they're going to lose at least six, yeah, if not more, right? Six to eight. Um, anybody have thoughts on this and where that's headed? Either one of you. Yeah, I, I think, uh, look, I, Kyle Flood won't keep all his children forever. One of those children's going to leave the nest <laughs> at some point, okay? It's just impossible. You can't recruit that many players and they all stay, even, even in today, even Texas having as much success as they've had. Um, so I, you know, if, if he doesn't lose somebody, I, I, I'd be a little surprised, honestly. Um, and then, you know, you look at it. I, one thing I'll say, I don't think Texas is going to lose anybody that's truly impactful of their season next year. That's the one thing I'll say. Now, there's going to be hey, we're, Texas has reached a point, and Starks talked about this. I mean, he's a confident coach. He knows he's got really good quality athleticism and depth on this team. So there's some guys that could leave the program that could go on and do really good things at other schools. That's just where Texas is at right now. I mean, there's there's going to be two or three players that leave this program that are very good football players. They just couldn't break through at Texas. That doesn't mean they can't go be an all-conference player somewhere else and maybe have a future in football. I think that's the one thing to know. That's where the Texas program's at. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm interested to see um, which positions, um, you know, uh, take maybe two guys leave versus one guy leave. I think there's going to be a couple of positions where multiple guys leave. Got it. Uh, CJ, what do you think, bud? Yeah, I, I'm with you, Jerry. It's It'll be interesting to me. It might be a bit of a surprise. You know, I expect uh, to see some guys on the defensive side of the ball depart. Uh, that's just the sake of where Texas is right now with their depth and their talent on the top end of their ones and twos. Uh, to me, if you are to go out, if Bear Alexander does enter the portal, I think he's a perfect fit. This is a guy that had 200 snaps a year ago inside of that A gap where right now on the roster, the only guy with more than 10 snaps in the A gap from a year ago was Tia Savea, who had 15. You know, Aaron Bryant only had eight. You don't necessarily have a Byron Murphy or a Devondre Sweat who ate up probably around 270 to 300 snaps a year ago in that A gap. So if that's what you're looking for, if you're Texas and that name does come available, it makes all the sense in the, on, in the world, on paper at least, to go out and add Bear Alexander to this defense. Uh, but in terms of what Texas will lose, I think Texas right now going into the fall, you will be looking at a very similar one and two depth chart from what we see this spring to this fall. There won't be much 
uh, attrition from that part of uh, their side of things. And Texas, Texas definitely got a healthy NIL situation, and that's contributing to that uh, ability to, for, for players to stick around, uh, but also a winning culture. And it's hard to leave that if you're a competitive athlete, if you're a competitor, you know, and so that's a good thing. All right, that's going to do it for the state of the program today. Thanks again to Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. Also, if you guys want to read more about what Jerry, CJ, myself, and others have to write and say about the Longhorns, uh, we have a special uh, offer right now. Go to ontexasfootball.com, uh, pick up our, pe our premium package. Uh, you can become an OTFOG. Use that code, OTFOG, all caps, no space, and you get $20 off your annual subscription. It's uh, $60 regularly. You get it for just $39.95. Again, that's OTFOG. Go to ontexasfootball.com. Dot com. All right, Jerry, CJ, we got uh, the portal coming up. We got another round of practices Thursday and Saturday. Sarks said they're going to go at it hard again this week. We also have a big recruiting weekend ahead. You guys covered that like champs last weekend. Uh, for uh, you guys, good luck uh, the rest of the week. We'll be talking uh, here and there. Uh, for CJ Vogel, Jerry Hamilton, I'm Bobby Burton. This has been On Texas Football's State of the Program. Hook up.